Hello, my name is Helge Gudmundsson from the Agile People team. Today we are going to explore a rather big topic uh, and a key topic when it comes to this entire course, which is knowing and leading yourself, self-leadership. If we look at our three levels of uh, how we approach uh, during most of our sessions, this would be very much focused on the interpersonal part, um, your relationship with yourself, and how you relate to other people. So in leading yourself, just to give sort of an overview, one, these factors are the things that we are going to be exploring. Um, how can you know yourself? keeping yourself motivated. We're gonna look at some mental models around this. We're gonna explore the topic of EQ and we're, to, we're gonna look into the topic of how do, you be, how do you become or how can you be a mindful leader? Um, when, we, when it comes to the topic of self-leadership, uh, one of the really big toolboxes that we have for this kind of thing comes from the area of emotional intelligence. Uh, this is something that was articulated to the best of my knowledge in the late 80s by Daniel Goldman, um, who naturally built off of the work of some others. And it's been a very um, thriving approach ever since. It's been developed uh, and is, is a living component of a lot of the very modern approaches, including mindfulness and other things. Essentially, this relates to, we can look at it in terms of two domains. Uh, what is happening inside of myself, the intrapersonal, my relationship with myself, my understanding of myself. Uh, and in uh, emotional intelligence terms, this is where the skill sets of self-awareness come in, the, of self-regulation and motivation, self-motivation. How do you keep yourself motivated? Then we have the other domain of how do we relate to other people? And that comes down to empathy. How well can we understand? How well can we sense how other people are? Uh, how, can, how can we relate to other people, understand where they are at? Uh, social skills, which is how do we communicate? Um, and then motivation, what motivates other people? Because one of the big, big things about understanding motivation is that not, we are not motivated to the same degree um, as other people by the same things. There is a lot of variance. What I might find very, very uh, stimulating, very motivating might be the most boring thing in the world for you and vice versa. And if I'm going to lead you, if I impose upon you what I think is motivating, then obviously all that is gonna create is a distance. So the degree to which I can understand what motivates you, allow you to communicate to me what, what are the things that drive you, then obviously I can, uh, that allows me to lead in a much better way. Being a mindful leader. One definition of this might be increasing your ability to attune to what is happening in the moment and to choose a response, to not be governed by your biases, um, your preconceived notions, um, by however you judge things or how you reacted to similar things in the past and also to not be governed by what you imagine might be the consequences of this, which often leads to fear-based approach because you want to avoid a lot of things. So it makes you controlling in the moment. This is just being in the moment. This is just relating to yourself and to other people in exactly what is happening now. And the key thing here is you choose a response that is appropriate rather than reacting to things as they happen because our reactions are mostly 
unconscious and their past patterns repeating themselves. And that leads us into a very interesting area to explore, which is to what degree are we rational beings? To what degree are, is our decision-making, is our assessment of uh, what is happening, um, to what degree is that logical and rational? And to what degree do we judge it and make decisions that are fu fully rational? And the answer to this is very, very simple. The answer is zero. We are never, ever in any situation um, fully rational about anything. One of my favorite quotes that sort of encapsulates this is that we are not thinking machines that feel, rather we are feeling machines that think. Uh, in modern psychology, for example, what we talk about is the two systems approach to how the brain works, the system one and the system two. System one in this context means uh, the parts of our brain that relate to things like fight or flight, the, where we have uh, automatic responses, how to, or reactions, where we have ingrained habits. Essentially, the things that we do really, really quickly, we react to things very quickly without thinking about it. And system two relates to the rational parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is capable of reasoning out, uh, using reason and logic to think through a solution to a complicated problem, etc. The thing is that our system two, our thinking reasoning part is the latest part. It's very energy demanding. And it means that and our brains, just like any other organism on planet Earth, we are sort of, we have evolved with efficiency in mind. So it turns out that it's our automatic, automatically reacting nature that is in control most of the time. It's only when we bump into situations that we cannot fully react to, that we activate our thinking reasoning brain. So it is very much true that we are not thinking machines. We are not rational reasoning beings like, uh, like Spock in Star Trek. Rather, we are feeling and sensing our way through this and we are occasionally activating our higher, um, higher thinking functions to reason, to use reason and logic about things. If we go a little bit deeper into this, um, the iceberg uh, has been a popular analogy to, to describe a lot of things. People have seen an iceberg when it comes to all kinds of things. I'm going to use it in this sense to sort of relate what is our visible results and behavior? How does that relate to sort of each level down the line to our physiology? Um, how our bodies interpret uh, what is happening around us. So from the top down, our results are based on our behaviors. Our behaviors are heavily influenced by our thinking, naturally. Our thinking, on the other hand, is the aware reasoning part of our cognition is uh, very, very heavily influenced by our feelings. And the, maybe the interesting nuanced part of this is that we split apart feelings and emotions. Uh, oftentimes these are sort of used synonymously. Um, we talk about emotions, we talk about feelings as, it's, as if they are exactly the same thing. But there's, an, there's, an inter, there's a usefulness in differentiating here between them. Feelings are the patterns of, or the emotional states that we can sort of recognize and put a name on. Um, Emotions, on the other hand, are like the chemicals in our brain. Um, the countless signals that our body and brain generate when processing the, the, the external stimuli from, from our environment. So how they sort of mix and match. Uh, a perfect analogy here would be um, the kids' movie Inside Out that most parents would uh, probably be familiar with 
where it's actually how the feelings blend together that creates most of our strongest experiences. And at the base level is our hardware, our bodies, our senses, uh, which are in contact with the external environment, the stimuli. And it's countless, literally. I've heard anything from tens of thousands to, to millions of stimuli every single day that we have to deal with. It's information overflow, which is why we have developed a lot of functions to simplify things. Um, but this is part of the reason why we are so biased and why we have these uh, simple heuristics that we use to navigate the world to essentially be able to uh, react quickly, preferably without thinking. Now, the reason that this becomes important is that our organizations are essentially a social construct. Without people coming together, uh, there are no organizations. Uh, we are co-creating our experiences through our interactions with other people. And for us to be able to learn, uh, if we, to create and lead learning organizations, we need to, we need this ability to get clear on our experience and other people's experience and not sort of fusing them together. Um, this is a model that is based, this is an approach that is based on the work of uh, Gervais Bush. He, he wrote a book that was published in, a, in 2008 or 9 called Clear Leadership. And he introduces some interesting terminology in this book, which I find useful. One of them is this concept of interpersonal mush, which is this phenomenon where in the absence of information, we start to make up stories about each other and we guess what's going on. And very often this is based off guesswork. Intermersion, the, the thing is that these stories that we make up, um, we almost never check or validate. We never reality check them. And thus they take on a life of their own. Um, an example would be this. Imagine if you will, a C a senior manager that is coming to meet the meet uh, their team in a meeting. Um, the manager comes in, acts a little bit differently than they're used to, uh, a little bit more silent, a little bit more withdrawn. And there's five people in the room. Um, so the first person is thinking, damn it, you know what, uh, I knew those rumors about layoffs are probably correct. Um, he's probably being distant because I'm gonna get kicked now. And the second one is maybe thinking, damn it, you know what, um, I was gonna approach him, I'm waiting on a decision about the funding for the project that we're about to start, and it's probably gonna be bad news and on and on it goes. Everybody makes up a story about reading into this behavior uh, of their senior manager. But in this case, what is really happening? Maybe the senior manager just got called by his wife and there's a problem with her son at school and uh, he's just processing that. Um, maybe there is some information, there's something happening which uh, this person cannot fully disclose, so they think that by being silent about it, they're doing everybody a favor until they can come, until they can give a proper presentation. Um, but this this is interpersonal mush, and nobody ever checks with each other, and th so this shapes the reality of things. Everybody goes from that meeting, and they probably gossip with other people at the water cooler, um, and this is this is severely undermining. Um, the culture, and it creates ripe conditions for all kinds of dysfunctional behavior and, and interpersonal conflict, politicking. So what we want instead of this is, some, is something uh, Gervais Bush calls interpersonal clarity. And interpersonal clarity is based, based upon this idea that we can get clear on what it is that we are experiencing and we can uh, get some sense of what other people are experiencing. So experience becomes a very important thing.
Now, oftentimes when we talk about what are we experiencing right now, we go towards the feeling. I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling nervous, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling whatever. But it turns out that there's actually four elements that make up uh, what we're experiencing at any given time, which would be called the internal game. And to get clear on our own experience, what we have to be able to sort of um, grapple with and separate in our brain to some degree is what are we observing here? What is it actually that I'm seeing just without any judgment being involved? Uh, what am I thinking about this situation? What am I feeling about this situation naturally? But also what am I wanting from this situation? All of this shapes the way we read into things and how we experience it. So another quote that I really, really like, um, this was sort of made popular by Stephen Covey in his seminal book, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He had, he this is often attributed to uh, Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian psychologist and a Holocaust survivor uh, and the founder of a very effective form of psychotherapy in, back in the 60s and the 70s. But he, when he was describing his experience of being in Auschwitz um, and what it was that made certain people able to hang on and able to, able to uh, maintain their humanity, um, able to help other people and support other people, rather than get pulled into the ego games and doing anything and everything in order to survive. This is what, this is what came out of this. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And that space is our power to choose a response. And in that response lies our growth and freedom. We can react to things based on fear and uncertainty, or we can respond based on uh, based on something that is a little bit more evolved. So if we go further and explore some, what are some concrete um, examples of our biases, we can start with a similar question again. When are we not biased? And again, the answer is pretty simple, never. It turns out that most of our biases are automatic tools that we have sort of evolved as homo sapiens to navigate a complex world. Um, they function as sort of mental shortcuts. And some of the reasons why we have evolved this, these functions is that we've always to some degree had information overload. Uh, we've always had issues with meaning making, sense making. Um, if information is not put into some kind of a context that has a meaning, uh, it's 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 Teflon. It doesn't stick. We don't we won't remember it, and it's just meaningless. We also have this constant need to act fast. Now this need to, has changed. Um, from in prehistoric times when this was uh, literally running from predators, but we still have this overarching sense that we, if we don't act fast, we will lose out on opportunities. We might be too late doing things. So there's always an urgency factor. And then what do we need to remember? What do we need to sort of uh, be able to transfer from, transfer from our short-term memory into long-term memory into experience that we can um, use later on? Now, the way this sort of works is that information overflow sucks. So what we create are filters. And lack of meaning is confusing. So we sort of, we fill in the gaps. We come up with these shorter or longer narratives, which effectively means that the way we filter things, it becomes a story. And then when we have these scenarios where we need to act fast or we lose our chance of things, what we do is we sort of jump to conclusions. The stories that we've created about the situation, they become decision factors. We just, we treat them as fact. And 
this isn't getting any easier. Uh, we have constantly more and more information coming at us. So somehow we have to try to remember the important bits. So the, what we've decided, uh, this sort of shapes and informs uh, mental models of the world. And mental models, they are things that we use to make sense of things later. Uh, identifying patterns that we've seen before, identifying some kind of a scenario that we, if we know what it's about, we don't have to think, we don't have to analyze, we can just react and we can just do whatever. So what are the obvious downsides of this? Well, we're people. We don't see everything. And, every, and, and, and the things that we do see are to a very high degree subjective. Um, our search for meaning can easily conjure illusions. We make up things that may or may not have, may or may not have any, um, it may or may not be true. Quick decisions can be seriously flawed. Um, typically when I ask this question in front of a, when I have a class of people, uh, who has, uh, made a seriously flawed decision in um, well, you know, some kind of a quick decision, often buying decisions. Um, occasionally, it might be uh, dating decisions, everybody, or work decisions. Um, everybody is intimately familiar with the fact that our quick decisions are sometimes seriously flawed. And then the What's worst about this is that our memory sort of reinforces these errors in judgment. We rationalize away. Um, we figure out ways that somehow why this was okay anyway, and that sort of um, that becomes our way that we navigate the next similar situation, which may not be optimal at all. Now, this is, this is sort of abstract. So let's look at four concrete biases just to get a really, really clear picture of what is going on. The first would be the affect bias. Um, the affect bias is this thing where my feelings about something frame and sort of flavor my judgment. This is the scenario where if, if you're a friend of mine, if I really like you, you come to me with an idea because you're, you're my friend and because I like you, I will just automatically support you. If, however, I do not like you, um, well, then I'll put up a bit of an obstacle course. You'll have to show me a lot of proof. Um, and you'll have to show me that you have support for this and you'll have to show me a well thought out plan for this. And even then I might not like you because I will be judging all of the proof and all of the plans they, it's going to be flavored by the fact that I, 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 un, underneath I'm not really super psyched about supporting you uh, just in general because I don't like you. Um, the attribution bias, often named the, fall, the false attribution bias, is this that we have a tendency to attribute traits to other people. Uh, we judge other people on their behavior uh, while at the same time, I judge myself on what is my intention. And the typical clear example of this is, let's say that uh, we are a team, we have meetings. Uh, you are on my team, and now for three, three times out of the last five meetings, you have been late. I'm sitting there and I start thinking, um, this is obviously a person that has no respect for other people's time. Um, they're being disrespectful. Um, they're being very selfish about this and just not a trustworthy uh, person to work with. Now, what I conveniently forget is that in the last three months before, I myself was late three times. However, in my mind, it was, you know, I had issues with my kids were screaming and fighting me on the way out. I had to drop them to the, to the daycare. Um, so I was late out the door. Um, because I was late out the door, I wound up in a lot of traffic on my way down to, um, 
on the motorway. Uh, the traffic obviously delayed me. Then I had to hunt around for a parking space and all of, all of which means that I'm late. So I didn't intend to be late. It's the circumstances that forced me to be late. So I'm not a bad person, it's just the circumstance. Um, the availability bias um, coined by Daniel Kahneman as the what you see is all there is bias. Um, This is what we talk about today in terms of social media bubbles. This is what we talk about. Uh, we make snap judgments based on what is the most prevalent information that we are exposed to. If you, if you watch a lot of news uh, or if you read a lot of conspiracy theories or we, we tend to, as humans, we have this tendency to just jump on board of that and say, okay, this is how the world is instead of looking at the bigger picture. Um, this is just one way of the world, which is being filtered because who knows, this might be a news agency that has an agenda. So they pick up anything that supports their agenda and they leave out everything else. Uh, but because that's all I see, what I see is all there is. I make judgments about the world and I make decisions about how to behave based on this information that I'm being exposed to. Um, and then we have the fourth, which is probably familiar with everybody who has ever done, you know, a bachelor's or a master's degree or um, any kind of, is, is familiar at, at all with the scientific process. Uh, the confirmation bias is where you only see the support for what you already believe is true. So when you go looking for evidence to support uh, whatever idea that you idea or suggestion that you want to put forth, you will pick up everything that supports you, but you will conveniently ignore everything that undermines you. Um, and it's very insidious, this thing, because we won't even notice it. We will just skim past it. Um, so how do we work with something like this? The key thing is to understand that biases are built in. This is literally part of our mechanism. We cannot prevent them from happening in the first place. Um, but what we can do, hopefully, uh, if we practice and with some training and with some awareness, is that we can train ourselves to become aware of when we are falling into a bias. And when we are aware of what we're falling into, we might, we might counter it. So how do we counter something like the affect bias? Well, which is if I like you, I love your input. If I don't, even with a great idea, I don't like it. The pattern is this, we form and we ask questions. And this might be just internal questions. It doesn't have to be explicit. It doesn't have to be things that we ask other people. But when somebody comes at me with, an idea, you, I might ask myself, why am I jumping on board so, so quickly? Why am I loving this idea so really quickly? If this was somebody else uh, presenting this idea that I didn't know, would I be asking for more evidence? Would I be asking for more support? Probably. So um, asking these kinds of questions gets you to explore. It activates our system too, our rational thinking, where we tend to think things through and seek support and apply logic. Now, the attribution bias, where we judge people on their behavior and we judge ourselves on our intent is that we have to connect with what might be their intent. So we might ask ourselves a question such like, what could make a usually smart and reasonable person behave like this? And typically the answer to this will not be, well, because they're a bastard or because they're an idiot. Um, quickly, we will come up with, well, maybe they're, maybe, maybe, maybe they're under pressure. Maybe they have a stressful situation. Maybe there's something happening at home. Maybe, maybe there's something happening, which we might then go and investigate. We might have a chat with them about this. Um, 
to reality check it because that that was the opposite if you if we call the interpersonal mush versus clarity is that the stories we cannot stop ourselves from making up stories but we can get better at reality checking and making sure that uh, there's there's something actually happening here the availability the availability bias um what else is out there where could i you know where could i find more information um what is the big picture here? What might be the opposite? Um, if, I'm, if I'm listening to, say, a scientist or somebody who is heavily advocating something, uh, do, they have, do they have somebody who, who is uh, opposing them? And what, what, what might be their argument? And just make sure that you go listen to that, um, just, just so that you have both sides of the coin. Um, Confirmation bias, like I said, this is insidious, um, but we can actually learn from the scientists here. So scientists, they form a hypothesis, but when they form a hypothesis, what they also do is they form a null hypothesis, which is essentially what, what would prove my idea wrong. And then, so we might ask ourselves the same thing here. I believe this to be true. However, if in any reality, uh, my idea would be wrong, well, how might that be wrong? Um, what would be sort of the conditions? What would have to be true for my idea to be wrong? And then we just come up with some things and then, then we have some indicators to look out for. If, if I start seeing this and I start seeing this, guess what? I might not have the best idea in the world. I might have to go to work on it some more. And just in general, some great universal questions, regardless of any situation, uh, when we're just, uh, we're confused, there's something going on that we're not entirely clear what is going on, but we just have a sense that maybe I'm being biased about something, uh, maybe something is going on that I'm not understanding. So this is just a really good question. What is going on here? What is really going on here? What is happening? Just asking the question triggers our system to thinking, our rational thinking, into come on, coming up with some uh, ideas that we might go explore. So this sort of wraps up the four biases. Um, just an interjection. This might also be a good good space to take a quick break. Uh, if you've been listening to this and all in one go, um, it's a bit of a lengthy module. It's a very important topic. Uh, and here we have sort of a chapter break where we slide from the four biases into another framework, which we call the four selves of the leader. So this might be a good space to press pause take a little break and then to come back um, in case you need that. Excellent. And then we move forward. So the four selves of the leader is based on the approach that I previously talked about, uh, the clear leadership approach uh, developed by Gervais Bush. It's an approach that sort of encompasses a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, it's mindful in nature. Um, it ticks off most of the boxes in terms of developing the skills of emotional intelligence. And it's a very useful framework to sort of just have, have, a, have a good clear picture in your mind. What is it that I need to be improving in my approach as a leader? Uh, both in terms of leading myself, but also in terms of relating and leading others. So the first of the four selves is the aware self. And to relate uh, these four selves to the skills of emotional intelligence that we spoke about in the beginning of this um, session, this would relate to the self-awareness skills and the self-regulation skills. So. Uh, 
what am I experiencing at any given moment? How am I biased in this situation? What am I bringing into this situation? And how, and how can I become self-aware um, about this kind of thing? So a couple of, a couple of really good practices that train this as a skill, even in your off hours, would be something that many people are familiar with, some kind of a mindful practice. Now for many, mindfulness is associated with meditation, but uh, there's also a far older, um, well, meditation is certainly old, but um, at least the way I relate to it, uh, journaling, writing your thoughts in a journal, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a big raft of research that shows that just the act of writing down in some way, shape or form during the day, what, what are you experiencing? What are you going through? What are you observing about something? What are, what are the ideas, the thoughts that are coming? This tra literally trains the part of your brain that um, activates your self-awareness and this ability to sort of uh, introspect. Introspect introspection is the best uh, the best way I've ever seen this um, described. Was this is sort of like the director of a play? Um, if you imagine, if you imagine whatever is happening, you're on this you're on the scene of a theater, and occasionally. The director will say cut or pause. What is going on here? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Um, why are you not in the places? This is this ability for us to be our own director, to, to press pause, to say cut. Um, what is going on here? Why am I responding like this? Um, what am I observing here? What am I thinking here? What am I feeling here? What am I wanting out of this situation? and just to generate some clarity. Now, to be able to do this, I'm going to come back to our model of with the iceberg. And in this case, I'm going to start from the bottom up. So what mindfulness gives us um, and some of the mindful practices is this mastery of our breathing. Um, whether you do mindfulness exercises, whether you do um, meditation, whether you do things like yoga um, or any of the other sort of things, it's been known for a very long time that mindful breathing, uh, regulated breathing, it gives, what it gives us is control of our physiology. And in technical terms, when they hook people up to the kind of sensors that figure out what is happening out what is happening in their body. Um, the physiological response is that they, when we start breathing mindfully, um, we regulate our heartbeat. And this is very, very important because irregular heartbeat is what is associated with what we know as amygdala hijack or self-induced lobotomy. It's this most people have at some point, uh, for example, experienced you've done a lot of homework for a test and then you and you're very stressed for this test and you show up and then just freeze and you, you, you don't remember anything. Um, this is what is happening here. Uh, this is regular heartbeat. So, so what we can do is we can regulate our breathing. We can do we can focus on just mindful breathing. And this will regulate our heartbeat and this will, and that will catalyze this thing where we get access to all of the parts of our brain. Again, the thinking parts of our brain. When we get this control of our physiology through the breathing, we have uh, access to memories, knowledge, reason. We can start to ask ourselves questions. We can exercise the emotional intelligence skills, um, such as we can label our emotions. Uh, we can name our feelings uh, and we, be, we can become more aware of how we are thinking. And when we get a, 
when we when we become more aware of how we're thinking, then this automatically improves the quality of how we're acting in a situation. We start to respond rather than react to situations, and the, and based on how we behave, that produces a different result. So this is sort of how this thing uh, ties together. So, in summary here, increasing our skill of self-awareness is to become more aware of what is happening in each element of our experience and how our maps and biases are, are being influenced by this. On to the next self, which is the descriptive self. And again, if we relate this to the skills of uh, emotional intelligence, this would be the social skills, this would be the so and, and the self-awareness. So creating interpersonal clarity, the four skills of the descriptive self. So the first one is, the context for this is now that we have some idea of what is happening through, through the self-awareness, now we have to be able to relate this to other people. Uh, if I go back to the example of the executive in the room uh, with, with the five people who all started making up stories about this person because they were withdrawn and more silent than usual, if I am this, ex this executive and I would come into the room and say, guys, um, I know I probably don't uh, don't look and feel uh, fully myself. Uh, this has nothing to do with you guys. I just got a bit of uh, news from from home that uh, that I need to process a little bit. Um, so let's just do the best that I can. I'll do I'll do the best that I can, and let's just move on. Now I, uh, as one of the five people in the room, I have better information. I know a little bit about little bit about what's going on. And in this case, um, as the executive, I was being transparent that something had happened that was important for me, but I'm not necessarily being intimate. I'm not telling them all about it. I'm not sharing intimate details of my home life. I'm just telling them that something is happening in the home life that is having an effect and to not be bothered by it. Another really, really good skill is make statements before asking questions. Now, this making statements in this in this way is to frame the conversation better. Uh, to give an example of this, um, let's say that we have been having a lengthy session, and now I want to transition into. We're, we're, we're right in the midst of a lot of the, the heavy discussion, but I'm being aware of the time in the session and I want to interject a little bit. Um, I want people to start wrapping up. So I might say something like, as the facilitator, I might say something like, guys, I just wanna check in. We have about five minutes left. I'm thinking how might we use the five minutes how might, how might we make the absolute best use of these five minutes that are left? Um, and that might be enough. I've made the statement and I've asked the question. And probably someone in the, someone who is attending will say, well, I think we need to do this. Somebody else might say, we need to do this. We need a decision on something, um, whatever. But I've oriented the oriented the the conversation that is now happening. I've framed it in some way through making a statement. Describing the impact before responding. Um, this is this is sort of the key part in most of the conversation models that relate to having difficult conversations. Um, using examples of this would be the I statements, um, the language of non-violent non communication. Uh, it's this idea that if you have something you need to state, you need to say it. 
but preferably it should happen in a way that doesn't trigger the other person to become really re, um, reactive to you, defensive, for example. So I might preface something, my response to something by saying, uh, by just describing the impact as in, I'm, I have to offer a critique. Um, I think we're on a generally good direction, but I worry that if we don't address this thing before we move forward, we're gonna really, really regret it later. So I have to do this right now. Um, and then you go ahead and you describe whatever it is that you're worried about. And this way you give people a context to relate this to. Another way to do, do this is to describe uh, experiences, not judgments. Um, one way to say, state this, this is, this is more or less the difference between I statements and you statements. Uh, if I say, um, you did this really badly, that almost always will, that's a judgment. That will always provoke a response, usually not a good one. If on the other hand, I said, uh, well, when you were talking about that, what I was experiencing was a little bit of confusion. I wasn't really sure that what, what it is that you were trying to communicate um, and ask for a clarification or if, or if this was a presentation, you might offer a suggestion how they, how they could communicate this more clear next time they do that. So the four skills of the descriptive self and hopefully uh, for decent examples of how they might work. What this is about is being able to describe your thoughts, feelings, wants, observations, maps in a way that helps others see what's going on in your head. Um, and in an agile context, uh, everybody who has worked with some kind of an agile way of working is familiar with this uh, idea of checking in. I need to check in with you on something. That's actually a really good way of doing this thing about making statements before asking questions. I need to check in with you about something. I observed something in the last meeting. I've been noticing a pattern happening in our team. Um, and then you take it from there. Now, the third self is the curious self. And this relates to how we this relates to our attempts to understand others. Our ability to help others become aware of and tell you about their maps and experiences. And especially in the context that you might, you might have developed your skills in this er area, they would probably not have done that. Um, you, have, you have to be open to the context that it might not be entirely natural for the other person to do this. So this is about developing your ability to make it comfortable for, the, uh, for them to do this and to make yourself approachable to other people. Um, so three skills. Number one is the absolute most important skill when it comes to doing this. You need to park your own reactions. This is so difficult to do. Um, I will stress this to the end of time. You need to park your own reaction. Somebody comes at you, they, it might be a critique, it might be a judgment of you, it might be whatever. But if you're in a leadership position, you cannot react to this. Um, especially not in a defensive manner. What you do need to do is you need to respond to this. And a really, really good, if you tie together the first and the second is, this becomes almost like a mantra. Whenever somebody says something to you that is uncomfortable to hear, park your own reactions and confront for insight. Ask a question. Um, somebody, says, somebody offers a critique of you, um, you park your own reaction, becoming defensive about this. And what you do is you ask them, okay, um, can you help me understand this a little bit better? Uh, I'm not sure I understand completely. Um, can you give me some more context on this? 
and then just uh, help them to start describing it better to you. And don't inter intervene. You need to practice active listening here. Um, you need to give them their full attention, allow them to speak their piece um, so that you can get a full idea of what is it that they are experiencing. Make it safe and appealing to open up to you. And then the fourth self is the appreciative self. And this, re this relates to things like motivation, uh, empathy, social skills, and most, in particular, it relates to how can you give people um, what is the real type of constructive feedback, um, essentially positive attention. So using an appreciative approach, what you do is you focus on what you want more of and not so much on what you don't want from people, processes, and outcomes. So three steps to doing this. Number one, notice when you're focusing on what you don't want. This might be a person, this might be an interaction, this might be a process. And make a conscious effort to focus on what do you want. A really good question to ask yourself in this situation is what do you want? If this is what you don't want, what do you want instead? And articulate that. Uh, and that's step two, get clear about what you want more of. What would be the ideal for this person or this interaction? And then the really powerful stuff, uh, step three, is to realize how might you yourself be contributing to this interaction or problem. And if you're really courageous, you might ask somebody about this and have them tell you how, how, you, how your behavior uh, might be in some way contributing. So pulling this together, these are the four selves. Um, if you really go to work on these, and if you develop these four selves, the, the aware self, the descriptive self, uh, the curious self, and the appreciative self, what you've effectively done is you've stepped into coaching leadership. The combined skills here give you the tools and the competencies that you need to use, need to be very effective at coaching leadership. Uh, the skills and the behaviors here help you to build a connection of mutual trust. It helps you to frame questions and to use active listening to really understand what is going on with the other person. It helps you to give constructive and appreciative feedback, uh, relate, to re relate to other people in a way that they want to listen to you. And it enables you to keep yourself, your own reactions under control in crucial conversations and very difficult uh, situations. And that is a superpower when it comes to being a leader. I would say possibly the number one superpower because it enables you to uh, choose better responses. And then you can spend a lifetime coming up with a toolbox of really good responses. Another thing that this does is um, it's a very productive way to deal with uh, or to enable productive disagreements and resolving conflicts. Uh, conflict resolution skills. Um, the skills and the capabilities that you develop through the four selves help you to articulate your views and positions without triggering defensive reactions in the others. It helps you to find a common ground and to create clarity rather than confusion about what is going on. It helps you to explore and to understand other people's perspective. Um, and, it count, and it enables you to start uh, checking and maybe countering your own biases and to help other count, others uh, counter their biases. Uh, so all in all, this is pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Um, this is not easy in any, any particular way. Um, this is an invitation to really, really go to work on yourself. Uh, and you can probably spend a lifetime um, fleshing out and developing these things. And you will not be perfect. 
in, no, in, in, in all situations. Um, even if you know all of this, you will still get triggered and you will still have dysfunctional days. But the hope is that more often than not, you will become, you will be able to engage at this level. Um, and you will get more, better. Uh, this will lead to better interactions, better relationships, and better self-leadership, which enables you to lead others more effectively as well. This is just about what I wanted to talk about today. It's been a very lengthy module, uh, almost an hour. So hope, hopefully this is useful. And in the session to come, um, your facilitator will be exploring, helping you to practice these things through a series of activities. Thank you and uh, see you next time.